Good morning, everyone. So if people are still having problems with uh, registering for the right section of the class, please contact souls.advising at asu.edu and they can help you out, get those straightened. So today we're gonna to start with basic concepts. And really the idea here is <clears throat> immunology uses a lot of, of terms that are not found in other parts of biology. And so I want to present, present both a historical perspective of how immunology started and also what the, how, how we got to the current point in immunology. So the course objectives, when, when you complete this course, I expect you to understand how the immune system is able to recognize virtually anything that comes into, um, into your immune system, tell the difference between you and what is, is attacking you, and how it makes an appropriate response to infection. <clears throat> so we're going to cover all of the major cellular and molecular components of the immune system. We're not going to focus a lot on um, cell signaling or uh, focus on little details. Really, there's a lot in immunology, and we're going to cover sort of the major parts of it. And so at the end of this, really, I'm looking for students to know how you generate adaptive and innate responses to infection. What is the basis of immunological memory? What does vaccination do to modify that? And how we maintain tolerance versus um, what Ehrlich described as Horus autotoxicus or a autotoxic response. So there's a few things that we need to start with. And the first is just, what does the term immunology mean? And it comes originally from the Latin, meaning immunus, meaning that um, citizens or even entire villages could be um, immune from serving in the army or from paying taxes. And so it was a, a condition granted by the king. In Greek and Roman terms, that became immunitas, and that was usually just meant you were, you were free from paying taxes, something I think we all would welcome, um, and, and or military service. And this again could be applied to an individual, a whole family, entire village, or a whole region. In the modern usage of the term, it's just the state of being exempt. And we'll see that that, that doesn't really apply in responses to infection, meaning that you can still get infected, but you just don't have as much disease. Now, usually we, <clears throat> it's outside of the field of immunology, it's usually applied uh, legally, meaning that you cannot be persecuted or prosecuted for something. But in terms from this class, it's physiological because that you're exempt from infection due to prior exposure. And really, it's really exempt from disease, not um, from infection. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so the, t the field of immunology is the science of studying biological immunity. And it's really become more than that. It's now commonly applied to understanding how the immune system uh, develops, how it functions, what its role is in disease or, or protection. And it's become a, a fairly larger field. It, <clears throat> immunology is one of the younger fields of science or of biology. The field of immunology, the first textbook, didn't come out until 1996. And so it's really quite a young field and it changes a lot. So if any of you are wondering why Tony Fauci has changed his, his mind on certain things, it's also because we're learning a lot. Okay, so let's start off with the first um, known observation of immunity. And that dates roughly 3,000 years ago. And the first recorded use of variolation, and we'll talk about what variolation is later when we cover vaccines, but it was really the first vaccine. And so uh, Chinese, for lack of a better term, witch doctors or their physicians, but they're really sort of herbalists, would harvest scabs from people who had smallpox, dry these in the sun, um, 
they had quite elaborate uh, tables for what, how long this needed to be in the year. And so they would take those and they would uh, then blow the ground up scabs into the noses of children. And when they did this, about between two to 10% of the inoculated individuals that got this died. However, if they did nothing and waited for smallpox to come through a village, smallpox is quite lethal and, and it could decimate an entire village with 30 to 50% um, dying from natural infection. So this was really the very, very first vaccine. And it really took about 500 years for um, others to start noticing this idea of immunity. And in 429, the, there was a plague in Athens. Um, we don't really know what the disease that swept through us. It wasn't smallpox, um, probably was something more closer to the bubonic plague. But um, Thucydides, who was a, a philosopher at the time, observed that during this plague, those who had recovered from the disease in a previous plague had now no fear for themselves, meaning they were immune and could help others. And he also um, astutely recognized that there was a difference between people who just had a natural resistance, that they didn't have disease, uh, versus acquired adaptive resistance, meaning they had previously had um, the same infection. And that really moves us up into about 1500 years later, 1300 years later, where uh, Abu Bakr al-Razi in uh, what's modern day Turkey, differentiated smallpox from measles. And, and what was key in his observation was that he could tell if you got measles, you were immune against measles. If you got smallpox, um, you were immune to smallpox, but you, there wasn't cross protection. It was disease specific. And so those are really some of the very first observations in immunology. And it took quite a long time for um, any progress to be made. And it all really started with this guy, Emperor Kangji. So he was part of the, of the Lin Dynasty. And so when the Emperor Fu Lin died, he, um, he, he died from smallpox. Several of Kangji's older brothers also died from smallpox. And so he became the emperor. Now he had survived smallpox. And so he took this idea of variolation <clears throat> from the um, sort of rural physicians and mandated it for all of China. Now, this is a pretty bold move because he just wiped out roughly 2% of all uh, of the Chinese population at the time. However, what happened then was um, the, the entire country was then immune from smallpox. And so this made for China having quite a significantly stronger military presence than other countries. And sort of the idea then spread to other countries, well, they're doing it, so we need to do it to protect our troops. Because smallpox really was a big problem during wartime. And that was in the, in the mid 17th century. And when we move up just to the early 18th century, Lady uh, Mary Montagu was the wife of the ambassador to Turkey. She was British. And she observed that the Turks were doing smallpox uh, variolation and protecting the people from smallpox. And at the time, smallpox was a big problem in Europe and in England. And so she had her own son and daughter variolated to protect them against smallpox and then used her prominence because she was a lady, she had some uh, notoriety, she lobbied for variolation in England. And variolation quickly becomes a major medical industry. Sort of like that was the first uh, pharma biotech industry. It didn't take that long for this idea to move to the United States. And Cotton Mather, who many of you probably have heard of and in terms of the Salem witch trials, and all of that, that nonsense, brought smallpox to Boston with um, Dr. Zabdiel Boylston. Now, as you might guess, Cotton Mather was a rather strong-armed guy, and um, they, they went around and basically knocked on people's doors and forced them to get variolated. And so of those, they, they forced variolated 248 people um, in Boston, 
of those, six died. So you can imagine this at the time seemed like, like quite a dramatic move. And he was not really well liked for this. And so he was, he was attacked with the, sort of the first hand grenade this is where immunology <laughs> crosses over into uh, modern culture. And attached to that note, or attached to that hand grenade was a note. You dog damn you, I'll, I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. That's amazing. And it's, uh, it's notable that the hand grenade did not go off, um, but he was, he was sort of not well liked. <clears throat> so this idea of, of uh, vaccine resistance is quite old. So variolation really remained the main form of immunization against smallpox for about 70 years. And so this became not just um, sort of a minor medical thing, this became widespread and was, there were doctors who specialized in just variolation. That all really and, um, turned a bit when Edward Jenner observed immunity to smallpox in dairy workers. And so cows at the time had a similar disease. Uh, it was, it was um, vaccinia virus. Um, it probably wasn't cowpox, which is a different disease. <clears throat> but he noticed that the dairy workers who were working with these cows that had a pox-like disease typically didn't show uh, much symptoms if they were exposed to smallpox. Now, in reality, Jenner gets the credit for all of this, but there's at least three other people who made this observation and um, did inoculation with the pox from a cow um, and showed that that could protect them from smallpox. However, none of them were part of the Royal College uh, of Medicine, as Jenner was, and so their, their observations went, for the most part, unnoticed. Partly because only one of the three was a doctor, the other two were farmers that just did it. But Jenner did, took this one step further. He actually inoculated his own nephew. It's like sort of the worst uncle in the world. And then challenged his, his nephew with smallpox. Now, thankfully, his nephew survived. And so he wrote this, this up and, and tried to get support for what he called vaccination. Vaca comes from the term cow. And so this was a cowpox um, inoculation. It was not immediately accepted. And part of the reason was because variolation was this major medical industry. And it was very difficult to basically say, you're all obsolete. We need to do this much safer version. Vaccination has a much lower um, uh, death rate it's roughly one in 100,000 compared to for smallpox, um, it's roughly one in 10. Now I, take a, I should take a side note and say that variolation was done up until the mid 1970s and particularly in uh, parts of the Middle East, they would still have uh, sort of wandering physicians that would come to a village and give variolation or um, this dried smallpox pustules. When they did that, if nobody died, they'd have to repeat the entire thing. So it was a gamble. And so vaccination using cowpox instead of smallpox was much safer and was particularly embraced in the United States who were looking to sort of reject British things at the time. This is just after the Revolutionary War. And so the United States became sort of the first place where where vaccination really took hold and, and supplanted variolation. And that really what came down to a guy named Benjamin Waterhouse. And so he was one of the first to vaccinate his children against smallpox using um, Jenner's technique. And he encouraged uh, then President John Adams to initiate public vaccination programs. John Adams signed these into law and then Thomas Jefferson implemented them a few, few years later. So even very early in the United States history, we sort of became the, the focal point of vaccination. And that was, if you think about it, most of the history of this until at least 1800 was focused on smallpox. 
That's because it was very lethal. Um, but then we sort of come back to <clears throat> another disease that is pervasive in, even in our modern society, which is measles. And uh, Ludwig Panem, who was a physician who got stationed on the Faroe Islands. And for those of you who don't know, Faroe Islands are sort of in between Britain and Iceland. Um, and so they're very remote. They didn't have a lot of visitors. And so what he noticed is that <clears throat> there was an outbreak of measles on the Faroe Islands. And what Panem, much, much like Al-Razi in Turkey, noted that pe people who had previously had measles in uh, a previous outbreak, in this case 65 years ago, none of those elderly that survived that first outbreak became sick during the second outbreak. And so it indicated there was lifelong immunity. And so um, Panem sort of made the additional observation, which we'll stress a, a bit more later on, is that immunity is not just a fleeting thing, it's, it's lifelong. Now that's not always the case. I'm sure some of you have had vaccines that you have to get booster shots every 10 years. There's some indication that COVID-19 doesn't induce long lasting immunity, but we can come back to that when we talk about um, um, immune responses and disease later in the semester. Dr. Okay. Blattman? Yes. Quick question. So the, when they had developed the vaccination for smallpox, is that still the same technique that we use today when they're giving the cowpox for the smallpox vaccine? So there are, the short answer is yes. It's almost identical. The way mo we don't give um, smallpox vaccines to most people. The only people who get it are people that work with in laboratories where there's a risk of exposure to vaccine virus or other, other pox viruses. Um, and that's because we've eradicated smallpox. The last known case of naturally occurring smallpox was in 1976. And so we, anybody who's, who was born after 1980 doesn't normally get a smallpox vaccine. Now, having said that, <clears throat> As the original vaccines that were implemented, even up until the, the early 20th century, uh, it was basically grown on the side of a cow, it was scraped off and they were harvested that way. We don't do that anymore. We grow vaccinia virus in cell culture. Um, we then purify it, filter it, purify it, and, and it's a much better way of doing it. But the actual procedure is dipping a bifurcated needle into the vaccine and jabbing you. And depending on how well the nurse likes you, you may get uh, slight jabs or you may get very painful jabs. But it's essentially the exact same process. And we will cover vaccination again when on the uh, fourth part of this class when we start talking about vaccines. And we'll show you the different techniques that, that people have used. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So, um, is there another question? Yes, I have one. Does variolation only refer to cowpox and its role in creating immunity for smallpox, or is there other examples with different diseases? So, so uh, I'm glad you asked that. We, can, we come back to that at the end of uh, this lecture. But variolation comes from the name for smallpox. There's two versions of smallpox, a variola major and variola minor. And so variolation is inoculation with actual smallpox. Vaccination, which again takes the name from cow for vodka, um, is the process of using cowpox to inoculate you and protect from smallpox. So that they're slightly different. Thank you. Okay, so around the same time as, as uh, Panem's observation about measles, we come to really a central figure in a lot of biology, and that was Louis Pasteur, right? And he conducts experiments that showed life is not just spontaneously generated, right? He would take stuff and put it under, in a vacuum and show that you didn't just get um, life from nothing. And he started to identify microorganisms that cause specific disease. And so he develops this in the laboratory setting and he develops vaccines for cholera, anthrax, rabies, and could protect laboratory animals 
from these diseases. This was really the very beginning of intentionally figuring out if I give you a vaccine for this, I can protect you against the, the disease. And this sort of became, there were a number of individuals who were very important during this time. Louis Pasteur was obviously French. <clears throat> von Bering and uh, Kitsato Shibasaburo. Uh, von Bering was German, Shibasaburo was, um, was Japanese. And they showed that you could immunize with just a protein from diphtheria, not the entire thing, just a protein uh, toxin from diphtheria, and that would protect against disease. And so you've all had, <clears throat> presumably all of you have had your DTaP vaccine. That's one of the ones that ASU requires for you to be enrolled. And it's essentially the exact same vaccine. It is a modified version of the diphtheria toxin um, that's the uh, D part of it. And this is the same vaccine that you get and, and protects you from diphtheria, which hopefully none of you have had because it's quite an effective vaccine. And then we come to perhaps the first true immunologist. And this was Paul Ehrlich. And we, we will revisit him several times during the semester because he was really one of the first guys to to define what immunity was. And <clears throat> so he did this with two toxins, one of which was ricin. I don't know if you are old enough to remember, but the subway attacks in Japan used a, a toxin called ricin, which is terribly lethal to humans. And he showed that if you fed mice really low doses of these toxins, which were proteins, they could develop specific resistance to a lethal dose. Okay, so there's no infection here. This is resistance just to a protein. And what he further observed, and what we'll, we'll come back to when we talk about antibodies, is you could transfer resistance from one animal to another animal, either from uh, nursing from mother's milk or by transferring blood. And he proposed in the, in the blood, there was something which he called an anticorper, which is German, corpor is, is body. So this is an antibody. And this really became the, the first definition of what is immunity? And the idea was there was something, there was some protein in the blood that, that could uh, mediate resistance or immunity. Now, everything up until this point was perhaps some of, of uh, Ehrlich's early work was vaccinology, basically inactivating or killing some microorganism or using a closely related one to provide immunity so that when you get infected, you have minimal disease. Now, vaccination doesn't prevent you from getting infected or getting exposed to something. It just provides the immune system a head start so it can control it faster so you don't have a lot of disease. Many of the vaccines that we use today, including things like the measles vaccine, some of the flu vaccines, uh, were developed before we had any real understanding of how the immune system works. Many vaccines were developed in the 1950s and 60s, and we didn't really understand how the immune system worked for another 20 or 30 years. Um, and so for some of them, we still don't know how they work. And if you, uh, if you talk to an epidemiologist, they can say that a vaccine can really only do one of three things, it can protect you from getting infected, can reduce disease, or it can prevent you from spreading an uh, infection to others. For virtually all of our vaccines, we don't know which one of those it does. And really to move beyond this, we had to use more, uh, more sophisticated technology. And that included microscale filters. That was how we defined viruses that they could pass through a porcelain filter. It required the use of microscopes, new assays. There's many assays that are done in immunology that are not done in any other uh, field of science so that we could detect the immune molecules and immune cells, what their function was, and, and how the immune system worked. And this sort of, as we learned more, it became sort of a problem because the Ehrlich camp, of which Pasteur and, and uh, Ehrlich were, were friends, really said immunity was antibodies and that they were in the, important in the blood. 
But Ilya Mechnikov, who was Russian, observed white blood cells engulfing bacteria in a cell culture under microscopes. Now, in this actually all started with sort of the sea urchin or um, sea star cells, single-celled organisms that were attacking a rose thorn. And so he applied that idea and, and thought that white blood cells were the basis for immunity. And ultimately, this led to kind of a big feud in, in the field of immunology, saying which is more important, antibodies or cells? And it, we now know that you need both. If you've been watching any of the news on uh, coronavirus, scientists are now saying, oh no, we need more of this T cell response to be protective, the antibodies are going away. Well, you, you get both, right? You need both. And so this is a very old debate. And sort of progress was pretty slow um, until the 1920s when Heidelberger and Avery discovered what antibodies were. They found that they were these soluble proteins in the blood, they could separate them by electrophoresis, and that those antibodies could distinguish between different bacteria, different glycosylation uh, patterns on those bacteria. And so this was the first, aha, we have, we have some proof that antibodies are important and are doing this. That didn't solve the debate though, because there was still quite a lot of evidence that you needed white blood cells to, to get immune responses. And that ultimately led to three guys, three theoretical biologists, who each independently proposed slightly different versions of what we now call the clonal selection hypothesis. Now, uh, McFarland Burnett was Australian, David Talmadge and Niels Jern were, were uh, depending on how you characterize them, either British or American, I'm not sure that they've figured that out. Um, but they basically said that each white blood cell has an, a unique receptor that is specific for a different pathogen. And when you get infected, only the cells that have that unique receptor for that pathogen respond. Now, in reality, Niels Jern was wrong. He proposed that they all have the same receptors and that, that the protein sort of molded to fit it and that imprinted in the cell. We now know that was wrong, but that didn't stop them from co-awarding the Nobel Prize in Medicine to all three of them. So you can be wrong and still get credit for it, even in immunology. But this was all theoretical biology. There was no proof for another 20 years until the early 1970s, where we started to actually see what the immune system was, how it worked. And this is sort of where we're gonna start most of the, when we're talking about immunology, we're gonna start with roughly 1974. And so that, um, keep in mind, that may seem quite a long time ago to many of you. Um, most of you are probably not born then, uh, but I was only three years old. And so this is still, a, if you think about how old chemistry is, this is still a new field. And new discoveries are constantly being made. Okay, so let's talk about some terms. Some of them what you, may have heard of before, others you may not have. One of the things that we're going to use interchangeably in this class is microorganism. That is just a general terminology or general term for anything um, that is any microbe that can potentially infect you. Right, so it's algae, bacteria, fungal infections, helminths, protozoa, viruses, or prions. Um, I don't care that you know all of those, but those are the types of infections that we'll focus on. Now, obviously, the major infections that you get are viral and bacteria, but in other parts of the world, particularly um, in underdeveloped countries, helminths and protozoa are actually quite a large problem as well. Okay, so now we need to make sure that <clears throat> excuse me, that we're consistent about some of the terms. An infection is when you get growth of a microorganism in a host. Typically, we talk about infection as an established growth. This does not at all have to cause disease. You are infected with all kinds of things. You have a uh, gut microbiome <clears throat> that is an infection, but it doesn't cause you disease. A pathogen is a microorganism 
that when it infects you causes disease. If a microorganism infects you and there's no disease, it's commensal, meaning you're eating at the same table. That's what the term means. That doesn't mean that it's always beneficial. You do have some um, commensal bacteria in your, uh, particularly in your small intestine and your appendix, but some of those actually help you. So some of them aid in digestion, particularly some of the lactobacilli. And so in the cases, if there's a benefit, then it's symbiotic, okay? So an infection in microorganism pathogen, um, we often get those mixed up, but I, I really wanna keep them differentiated here because you do make immune responses to uh, pathogens, but you also make them to commensal and symbiotic organisms. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay, <clears throat> now if you remember, Ehrlich and, and uh, Shibasaburo, Kitsato, and others were immunizing people with proteins. So the term that we're going to use a lot in this class is antigen. And is that is any substance that can be recognized as non-self by the immune system. It was originally sort of loosely defined by whatever you were injecting into a host, but an antigen really is the thing that is being recognized. It's not the other stuff floating around in the, in the vaccine or uh, your injection. Now, one term that gets a little bit um, interchanged with epitope or with antigen is epitope. So if you think about it, an antigen would be the entire diphtheria toxin, excuse me, that you're injecting. That's a substance that's being recognized. The epitope is what part of that entire protein is being recognized. And so it's often used interchangeably with antigen, but epitope really means one little part of it. So for example, a, a protein could have hundreds of different epitopes on it, depending on what the immune system is seeing. And the sort of highlighted here, so if this is a microorganism, <clears throat> and let's say this is a coronavirus, these are the spike proteins of the coronavirus, <clears throat> the spike protein is the antigen or the envelope protein. That antigen is being recognized by antibodies. But those antibodies are recognizing two different parts of the same protein. And so those are epitopes. Now, when we talk about T cell responses, gets either even more further refined because the epitope is a linear piece of, of peptide that's actually being presented to the T cells. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a rough, scratchy throat this morning. Okay, are there any questions on the difference between an antigen and an epitope? We will revisit this quite a lot when we start talking about antibodies. Could you potentially define epitope as like a, a unit of an antigen? I don't know if I would call it a unit, but it certainly is the part of the antigen that's being recognized. Um, depending on how you use the term, it's not, there's not one definition of epitope. Um, it can mean slightly different things, but it is really the part of the antigen that's being recognized by the immune system. Um, is the antibody's effectiveness determined by like how much, like how many epitopes, I guess, can be recognized from it? Absolutely. So um, as you all probably know, we still do not have an effective vaccine against HIV. Okay. Now, part of the problem for that is that the epitopes that need to be recognized are buried underneath the envelope protein of the virus. And so it's very difficult to get antibodies that are effective at neutralizing HIV. What many of you may not know is that eventually in any given person who has HIV, they do eventually make antibodies against the virus that are quite effective at neutralizing it. But the virus changes so much, it's sort of like hitting a moving target. So many of the antibodies that are, are raised against HIV are completely useless. And if we move to other viruses like dengue, they actually not only are, are no good at neutralizing the virus, they actually aid the virus in getting into cells, white blood cells, so that the virus can replicate better. 
it's a, a phenomenon known as antibody dependent enhancement of infection. So depending on what epitope is being recognized, the antibodies can have dramatically different results. I have a question. Yes. So you said T cells are presented with um, linear sequences of amino acids. Are these T cells not going to be as effective if these amino acid sequences are buried in the protein, um, like via steric hindrance or something? Well, we'll get to that. Um, the short answer is no. Many T cell epitopes come from the inside of a protein. And partly because when you're generating epitopes for T cells, you're putting it through something called the proteasome, which, which degrades the protein and chops it up. And so, um, no, that's not a problem for T cells at all. But we will certainly, we have entire lectures on just how those epitopes are generated um, in each cell. So we will come back to that. All right, any other questions before I move on? Okay. Now, as I said, infection is not the same as disease. And this, perhaps more than anything else in medicine, is one of the more confusing things, particularly to people who haven't studied the immune system. And so, if you think about it, you're, you're infected with all kinds of commensal symbiotes, other things. Some of you may have pathogens. If you've had, um, if you've had mono, you've got, um, you've got EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. If you likely were exposed to cytomegalovirus early in life, and so you, have, you maintain those throughout your entire life. You're infected with them, but they're not causing you any disease. If you've had measles or you've had the measles vaccine, you harbor measles, and that can come back later in the form of shingles. So infection is, is, doesn't mean the same thing as disease. And so you can, have, <clears throat> you can have an infection, and oftentimes we think, well, that immediately leads to disease, but that's not always the case. You can have a disease, um, could be to, you know, let's say you get the flu, uh, influenza virus that infects you, you make an immune response to it and you get sick. For bacterial infections uh, in particular, disease is, is often mostly due to bacterial toxins, but there is an immune component. If you've ever wondered, when I get infected, why do I get sick? And that's really your, your body is trying to make your, you an inhospitable place for whatever is infecting you. And so it does this by raising your body temperature. It makes a protein called interleukin-6 that goes to your hypothalamus and, and causes you to have a fever. So that microorganisms don't replicate it as well. It can also cause uh, behavioral differences, including uh, myalgia or, or malaise, where you just don't feel like doing anything. And that's because your immune system is saying, we need all of your energy to fight off this infection. So, particularly <clears throat> for viral infections, most of the disease that you actually feel is the, due to the immune response to the infection rather than the infection itself. We see that with COVID-19 <clears throat> with the sickest of patients actually getting uh, corticosteroid treatment and that uh, alleviates some of their more serious symptoms. Well, what are those steroids doing? They're actually suppressing the immune system because a lot of the disease that you're feeling in that infection is due to the immune response to, the, to COVID-19. So an important part of immunology that we sort of don't spend a lot of time on, but really if we didn't have this, we would, none of us would be here. And that is our barriers to infection. And th the first one is the skin, right? This is basically your exterior epithelial layers. If you've ever wondered, burn victims often will die from infection. And that's because they lack this, this uh, barrier to infection and so they can't fight off everything. And so the analogy that I like to use, this is, this is sort of the walls of a castle, right? They're protecting you from whatever's trying to enter you. And so the first part of that is the epidermis, right? The epidermis and dermis are really those top layers, and, and particularly the epidermis is mostly just dead cells. 
So if you remember from virology, a virus needs a live cell to replicate and grow in. Even bacteria um, are sort of stuck in this, this desert of dead skin cells. They can be there, but they can't get through that, that layer. And so really they're, they're unsupported of, of pathogen replication. And you're constantly shedding these. You wonder, wonder, why am I always shedding skin? It's because you're just trying to fluff off anything that's on you. And that prevents um, overcolonization by bacteria and fungi. But your, <clears throat> your epithelial cells are also producing things. And so they make uh, proteins called defensins. And there's a whole family of these. These are, are proteins that basically insert into bacterial and fungal cell walls and uh, form pores. And so once they do that, then that microorganism loses the uh, membrane potential or the potential across the membrane, and they die. There are also proteins called the cathelcidins that bind to particularly bacteria and, and some fungi. And they are, they're more like a detergent they bind to lipopolysaccharides, and this destroys, destroys the microbial cell walls. So you're making things all the time that are destroying things that are trying to get into you. You also make sebum, right? This is the oil on your skin that it, well, a lot of us try to minimize that, um, but it's actually a very uh, useful secretion because it traps uh, microbes in it and allows them or prevents them from uh, getting into you. And then you also sweat, particularly here in Arizona, right? You make lactic acid that lowers the pH on your, on your skin. That's not a good place for bacteria to grow in. You're also making uh, proteases that will cleave certain peptidoglycan linkages on bacteria. And so you your skin is not just this dead layer. You're actively making stuff to fight off uh, things that want to potentially get into you. We don't typically think of the skin as a part of the immune system, but it's rather as a barrier to infection, so it prevents the need for an immune response. But many people will say, no, the skin is absolutely the most important immunological uh, component. And if you don't have it, as I said, with, with uh, burn victims who've lost their epidermis, they get terrible infections. Now, Dr. Blattman? Yes. Are all uh, layers or all areas of the, how do I want to say this, um, are all of the barriers to infection nonspecific? So specifically, I'm wondering about the epithelial cells that are producing the defensins. Is it poking holes into all the microbial cell walls or is it <clears throat> trying to be specific about the only ones that are harmful to us? It's doing it to all. And okay. And it's not preventing stuff from landing on you and, and sort of being there. If you were to just do a swab of your skin, you would certainly find bacteria, okay? It's what it's trying to do is just keep the numbers down. And so the defensins are a whole family. And some work better on gram negative, some work better on gram positive, um, and some work on fungi, some will even work on membranes of viruses. Um, so there's just making lots of this stuff, hoping that it can sort of minimize the amount of microbes on your skin. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's great, except you still have to exchange stuff with your environment, right? You need to exchange food, oxygen, reproductive uh, material, you know, you have to have waste coming out. So there's a lot of sort of holes in the skin where you're trying to, to take in um, something from the environment. And so these are really, your, it's still epithelia, but it's basically the mucosal surfaces. So this includes uh, genital urinal tract, it includes the digestive tract, you know, the um, your bronchial tract, it includes your um, the lacrimal glands of your eyes. You know, anywhere where you're exchanging something with your environment, you have a mucosal surface. And this is sort of skin plus, right? It it's, uh, doesn't have the dead uh, epi epidermal layer on it. Instead, it uses things like mucus, right? And so you have things um, like goblet cells in your um, digestive and, and urogenital tracts that are making mucus. 
mucus traps microbes. It gets them stuck. And you're making a lot of the same thing, lysozymes, which break down uh, peptidoglycan leakages. You make lactoferrin, which is a protein that sequesters iron. And iron is a key thing. If, if uh, bacteria don't have it, then they can't keep going. You make uh, superoxide anions by lactoperoxidases. You also are secreting defenses there, right? So it's just like all the things in skin plus a bit more. Um, and this includes the cilia, which are propelling the mucus um, to come out of you, right? Either by the throat or the digestive tract. And so mucosal barriers are sort of skin plus extra defenses because virtually everything that infects you is going to come in through a mucosal barrier. Now, another part of this that sort of minimized a lot is the idea that if a bacteria is going to come into your digestive tract and, and it's pathogenic, it's still got to compete with everything that's already there. And so a lot of, we're, we're coming to recognize that a lot of diseases are tied to what kinds of bacteria do you have in your um, intestines. There's some sets that are very good and then there's some that are bad and that's a lot of that has to do with competition uh, against anything trying to infect you. So the vast majority of microbes will enter you via mucosal surface because this is where you have to exchange information or, or uh, products with your environment. And so you have to have these other layers of protection at mucosal surfaces. Skin is just it's a dead you know, dead layers of a desert for microbes, and so there's really nothing there for them to do. And that's a, a lot of, we're gonna skip over a lot of sort of barriers to infection stuff. In the advanced immunology class, we have an entire section on mucosal immunity um, because there are some different rules. Um, but really in this class, we're going to focus on systemic immunity, meaning blood infections or um, infections that get into the blood. Okay, so your immune system, virtually all of the cells of your immune system come from a single progenitor cell called a hematopoietic stem cell. This is a, a uh, stem cell that's in your blood and often found, usually it's found in the bone marrow. And this goes through a number of steps to give you not all, only your lymphocytes, your B cells and T cells, gives you natural killer cells, but it also gives you things like red blood cells. It gives you things like platelets, right? That come from mega karyosote. And then it gives you, if you can see where my pointer is, all of these other cells, um, the, the innate subsets, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, uh, monocytes and macrophages, there are a lot of other cells, or there are a lot of other cells, and we'll cover all of those when we talk about innate immunity. We don't cover much about uh, erythrocytes and platelets because that's more part of the healing process, but the immune system is not only there to kill what's in infecting you, the immune system also does all of the healing afterwards and the cleanup. And so there's, there's two sides to the immune system. Okay, so, so virtually all of these cells or all of the cells of the immune system come from hematopoietic stem cells. And these are a true stem cell, meaning they're self-renewing. So a hematopoietic stem cell can divide and give you more hematopoietic stem cells. And these are often used sort of as an alternative to embryonic stem cells because they can give you, they can be differentiated in all types of different cells. The process of making all of these immune cells is hematopoiesis. And all that means, heme is just blood, and poiesis is just generation, so it's just a weird term for generating your blood cells. Now, we sort of divide, if you look up here at this diagram, the hematopoietic stem cell goes to a uh, pluripotent potential, or a pluripotent uh, cell, or hematopoietic precursor cell, and then it has to make a decision. It becomes either a common myeloid progenitor on the left, or a common lymphoid progenitor. Now your myeloid progenitor then gives you all of the granulocytes, the macrophages, 
your uh, platelets, everything on the left side. And so we typically say that myeloid derived cells provide innate immune cell functions. They're the sensors, the ones that are, say, hey, there's a, an infection here, you should probably make an re immune response to it. On the other side are the lymphoid progenitors. And this gives rise to your B cells and T cells and, and K cells. Those typically provide adaptive immune functions, meaning your immune system is recognizing it, it's making antibodies and T cell responses to that particular infection and gives you immune memory. Okay, so they're sort of separated. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. There are, if you look over here, MK cells, which are typically not giving adaptive responses. And then there are some examples of, of uh, myeloid drive cells that can provide longer, long, long memory. But in general, myeloid cells are going to give you innate cell function. Lymphoid cells are going to give you adaptive immune cell functions. And that'll become clearer as we, as we go through the semester. Okay. So I know this first lecture is heavy on a lot of terminology, and, but I think it's important that we sort of define what we mean up front and so that later on in the semester we don't get confused. So there's some basic immunological principles. If you, were to, if you suddenly had you know, godlike powers and you were going to create your own organism, you would say, it needs an immune system. What would I want that immune system to do? And we now know that even bacteria have immune systems or a version of an immune system. And one of the things that's a cardinal property of the immune system that it has to do is be able to tell the difference between you and what's trying to invade you. And so this is often described as self versus non-self discrimination, um, but it's really, how do I know that this is something I need to make an immune response to? Now, if you're still, you're still sitting up on your cloud to, um, deciding how to make this immune system, you'd also want it to basically to be able to respond to virtually anything that comes at you, right? So microbes evolve much faster than we do, particularly viruses are evolving in many orders of magnitude faster than us. So as they change, we have to be able to recognize the new version. And so that, is the principle of diversity. The immune response has to be able to respond to almost anything that comes into contact with. Now you're still up on your cloud and you think, well, that's great, but the immune response should only recognize that one infection. If I got, if I got an infection coming and I just make everything respond, it's probably gonna kill the host. So we have to tailor it just each immune response must only react against the, that one foreign microbe that initiated the response. And that's the principle of specificity. Okay, so then here's the problem. Viruses and bacteria, other microorganisms replicate much faster than you do. Your replication time is roughly on the order of, of nine months, right? A replication time for a typical bacteria is on the order of several hours. And so it, in order for your immune system to be effective, it has to respond in that same kind of time frame. And so that's the principle of rapidity. It has to be rapid responses. The doubling time for a T cell, once, it, once it's told to make a response and starts responding to a viral infection, the T cell can double every four hours. So that's the same speed at which microorganisms go and so you get a response that is able to keep up. And so the last one is memory, right? Um, and this might surprise you that the idea of memory was not really settled until the early 2000s. And really the idea is that the immune response to some pathogen or some infection should provide long lasting immunity. And that's what protects you from subsequent disease. Well, I remember having a conversation with Rolf Zinkernagel, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine for their discovery of how T cells will recognize things. And in 2000, he still didn't believe in immune memory. His argument was, if you survive the first time, well, you're just naturally resistant or resistant to that infection. If we go back, Thucydides differentiated between those two things. He differentiated between natural resistance 
and immunological or immunity, okay? But this was really put to, to rest by Rafi Ahmed and others um, in the early 2000s. It showed what memory was. How do you develop memory? What, what tells a cell to become a memory cell? Okay, so these are the five general um, principles for an immune system. Now, I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, bag by telling you that most of these are complete nonsense. This is what we'd like it to do, and this is what we teach in the textbook. But if you think about it, discrimination, well, you need self versus non-self, but you have autoimmunity where you, the system fails. You have immune responses to cancer. Well, that's still you, right? And there are things that the immune system doesn't recognize. And we'll talk about some of the other ones. But a lot of this is sort of dogma. And there are lots of exceptions to this. Okay. Now we talked about myeloid cells generally provide your innate immune functions. And that's really more on the side of, of natural resistance. Your lymphoid cells provide your adaptive immune functions. And that's really immunologic memory or you know, what we think of as immunity. And so on your innate immunity, you have myeloid cells. And these are, we, on the next lecture, we'll start talking about what all these different cells are, but the innate immune system has really two main jobs. It provides that immediate antimicrobial effect or immediate resistance to infection. That's its first job. The second job is to say to the adaptive system, hey, there's something here that you need to make a response to. And so those are the two main jobs of innate immunity. The innate immune system is an immediate response. You don't have a delay. Their cells are there in virtually all of your um, body surfaces, in all of your organs, you have some of these innate cells and they're ready to go. They don't require proliferation or di differentiation into effector cells, they're just ready. They're not disease specific. So the, the innate system functions, excuse me, by recognizing sort of common structures. They'll recognize lipopolysaccharides or they'll recognize um, different fats or sugars that are associated with microorganisms. But, you know, the same structure could be on a handful of different uh, gram-positive bacteria. Okay, and we call these pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. And that's really because this is what the innate system uses to recognize there's something foreign here. It doesn't recognize antigens, okay? So if you want to put it in another terms, the innate system recognizes things like fats, sugars, um, DNA or RNA, things that you are either in the wrong place or things that you don't have. The adaptive system recognizes antigens, which are structures that it's been told to make a response to. Now, for the innate system, if there's no pathogen, then there's nothing for it to do and it shuts down. And so after the microorganism is controlled, cells return to normal numbers, they'll go back to what they were doing and they just pretend like nothing happened. On the other hand, the adaptive system or the adaptive immunity is provided by lymphoid cells. Primarily in this class, we'll talk about B cells and T cells. It has one main function, provide a specific massive response to whatever's infecting you and kill it. And hopefully the sub, sub function of that is hopefully not kill you in the process. But as we know, many infections we, that we die from, we're actually dying from the immune response to it. It's a delayed response. So if we go back to the clone selection theory, every cell has a, has a different receptor on it. And so we've got to pick out the one out of millions that is specific for that one microorganism or that one epitope. And so once it does that, it has to proliferate and it differentiates into effector cells. And this is really where we started in the 1970s, figuring out what lymphocytes did. Before that, lymphocytes were called small, uninteresting, boring cells, they thought they were probably on their way to dying or senescence, and nobody knew what they did. But now we know that they're probably the most important cells for generating 
protective immunity. It is antigen specific. So you're only recognizing that B cell is only recognizing that one epitope on that antigen. It doesn't now work for, remember, if you're immune to smallpox, you're not immune to measles necessarily. So it's antigen specific and you have memory. After the pathogen is controlled, you still have higher numbers of cells that are floating around ready to go again if you get infected by the same pathogen. This is true for B cells and for T cells, as well as antibodies. Okay, so the two systems function sort of differently. But one common misconception is that you only get an adaptive response if the innate system fails, and that's totally wrong. You, if you get an infection, they coordinate with each other. The innate system is coordinating with the adaptive system saying, we're gonna do this, here's your, here's your marching orders to go and make a, a response to the infection. And so they're communicating. And I think that's where a lot of people don't realize is that your innate and adaptive systems have to work together, otherwise the entire thing falls apart. Okay? So an easier way to think about this is what do they do, right? So another way to show it is how do they play into these cardinal features of the immune system? Well, the adaptive system doesn't really, it, there are some ways that you're eliminating self-reactive adaptive immune cells, and we'll talk about those during B cell and T cell development. But the discrimination really comes about with the innate system. It recognizes these foreign structures, these pathogen-associated molecular patterns as foreign. Your adaptive system doesn't really have to do that. It relies on the innate system telling it whether yes or no you should make a response. When you get to diversity and specificity, that's really the adaptive system, right? The, the adaptive system, you have something like 10 to the 12th different lymphocytes circulating in your body right now. That's a million millions. Um, and they each have a different receptor on them. So they can recognize at least a million million different things. The innate system, they, there are families of these different PAMP receptors that we'll talk about in, in a few lectures from now. But they're just, they're on the order of tens or 20 of these. So there's not a huge amount of diversity. There's a limited number of different cell types, um, but it's really, the diversity is on the adaptive immune system side. And again, the specificity is only linked to, well, I can recognize LPS if I'm an innate cell. So if I can recognize LPS, I can make a response to anything coming in that has LPS on it. But the effect, you're, you're basically just responding to whatever you're seeing there. And then we get to rapidity, all right? The innate response is immediate. As soon as there's an infection, you're detecting that. The adaptive system takes days. If you think about how, how long after exposure to, uh, let's go with COVID-19, how long after exposure do you start to feel sick? Well, you're starting to feel sick because your adaptive immune response is kicking in, and that takes a couple days. And so by five or seven days, you're starting to feel symptoms, and then roughly at, at the peak of the uh, adaptive immune response at, at 10 to 14 days, you're really the sickest. And so it's delayed. Innate, uh, we are learning more about memory and the innate system does have very limited innate memory. There's some that we'll talk about, but it's really memory is a function of the adaptive immune system. Okay, so the, the different jobs, or well, we talked about the different um, principles of an immune system, are handled by uh, both the innate and adaptive system, but they take the lead on different parts of it. Okay, so now this is the, the uh, if you ever want to impress your friends by speaking in Latin, you have, what are the cardinal features of an immune response? Well, the easiest way to remember this is, I think we've all had a zit, right? Anybody know what a zit is? It's an immune response to an infection. And primarily, a zit is dead neutrophils that have exploded and are trying to coat whatever was infecting you in that pore, coat it and get rid of it. 
So when you think of a zit, it's painful. It can be hot. You know, if you've ever had a, um, an infection, the, the temperature is quite high. Um, there's swelling and redness, okay? Those are the four cardinal features of an immune response. In Latin, it's dolor, calor, tumor, rubor. Just remember those and you can impress your friends. Rubor is red, tumor is swelling, calor is heat, and dolor is pain. Now there's a, there's a fifth one that people will sometimes include, and that's loss of function. But the loss of function is really due to these other four uh, features of an immune response. Now that's not what we typically think of when we think of, well, I've got a viral infection and I'm getting sick, right? And so this really refers to localized skin immune reactions. When you experience this systemically, as if you got the flu or coronavirus or some infection, it's going to come out differently. It's going to be myalgia. That's still pain, right? Or uh, malaise, which is a, a feeling of discomfort or uneasiness. Your fever, that's still calor. Chills is from calor, you're sweating too much, your body temperature gets dysregulated. And then all of these other things, headaches, which is mainly from swelling, right? And you're congesting, etc. So these are all still the same features of an immune response, but it, it's easier to remember these cardinal features thinking of a zit. But they come out differently when it's systemic. Okay, now we need to be clear. You can have all of these features in the absence of a pathogenic infection, right? So this is sterile inflammation. It's, it's also sometimes known as, this is, can be autoimmunity. It can also be tissue damage, right? If you've gotten hit hard enough and you get a bruise, the immune system is still what comes in and takes care of all of that tissue damage. Okay, so you can get all these cardinal features without any infection, but you also can get infection without any of the cardinal features. And that's what's seen in, in what is called cold infections, most often seen in immune compromised individuals, but it can also occur sort of in, um, in granulomatous disease or things where you've formed something and the infection is walled off and you no longer have these symptoms. You don't, so don't always have to have all of the symptoms at the same time. You can have just some of them. Okay, so the question really then, if we go back to the history of immunology, it all started with vaccination, right? And so what is, what is it that we want a vaccine to do? Well, the idea is a vaccine is, to, is something that's going to activate your immune system get it to make a response, but not have disease. And this is actually a pretty tough thing to do. You think about it, we try to make safer and safer vaccines that don't cause disease, but they become less and less effective because they're not engaging the immune system as well. So in order for a vaccine to work, you need immunologic memory. That's a function of the adaptive immune system. However, to get the adaptive system to work, it has to be told by the innate system, there's, there's something you need to make a response to. And if it's such a weak thing that it's not replicating or not, not doing anything, then the adaptive system doesn't work very well. Okay, but let's say that there's an infection. Here, this is viral load. And you make an immune response to it. The response then goes away again or, or declines. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about T cell responses but you end up with more cells than what you started with. So you're at higher levels of immune cells and antibodies. And so the next time you get infected, that response can go up much faster. And so that it really reduces the amount of virus that can replicate in you and eliminate it quickly. And so immunity is not, or is not, the, um, is not immune to immunity to being infected. It's just you are starting with such a good advantage that you're able to control whatever gets in much faster and eliminate it. So if we think about this, where we started, which was variolation, that was a low dose of a mostly killed pathogen. It was the low dose of dried out smallpox pustules. And so we're pretty good. 
vaccination is cowpox. Now, cowpox doesn't replicate in humans as well as it does in cows. And it also doesn't look exactly like smallpox, but there's enough cross uh, reaction with the human pathogen that it protects you. And so um, really vaccination is just a safer version of variolation with something that doesn't replicate as well. And so the immune system can control it better. But that brings us to a big problem, right? We just said the immune system has to be specific. It only should respond to whatever is infecting you at that time. Well, vaccination or using cowpox to immunize against smallpox violates that rule. Right off the bat, we've already invalidated one of our main rules of the immune system of specificity. And that's really, there's cross reactivity between these two closely related pox viruses. So what, this is just a question for the class, what must the two pathogens share? Anybody can answer. Would they share uh, an antigen potentially? Okay, antigen, epitope would be also acceptable because if it's recognizing something on, um, on one of the pox viruses, it's also recognizing that same structure on the other pox virus, okay? So I will put up into the bonus points as soon as in a few minutes, um, this extra credit question. You've all received a number of vaccines, right? And the problem is a lot of these appear to violate this rule of specificity. And so again, the answers don't have to be correct. You just have to take a shot. Tell me another vaccine that violates this rule. And that will be up on Canvas within the next hour. And that's where I'm going to stop today. We're a few minutes early, but that's because we took out uh, some of the uh, syllabus information that we went over on Thursday. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Pladma. Uh, yes. When you said in the previous slides that when we get the infection, the adaptive immune cells uh, act, uh, become active and we have the memory in our body. So the next time that we get infection, uh, they're going to respond faster. Correct. Uh, what about now about the coronavirus? That's uh, there's a, some idea that when the pa patients get the second time infection, they show the uh, harder uh, symptoms for that virus. Okay, so there's some there's some misconception here. To my knowledge, there's only been one patient that's documented at the molecular level to have a second coronavirus infection. Mm -hmm. Most of the time what people are talking about, and they got fooled by this quite early, COVID-19 can persist in the human body for up to 45 days. And so, but it does so not at a high level. And so what's happening, what most people think is happening is that people are getting a negative test, but they still have virus in there, it's just below the level of detection. And then they, they get a second test and the virus has, has gone through a little spurt and it comes up positive. Now, in terms of disease, um, it's not worse in a second infection. What's happening is it's a progressive disease. There are some diseases like dengue that if you have dengue the first time, then you get, you know, sick. But if you get dengue a second time, you can have what's called dengue hemorrhagic disease. And it's because you've had that previous infection. Now, having said that, we are still working out all the, the different things that are happening during COVID-19 infection. But I will say that a lot of people have sort of misinterpreted the immune system and tried to make, suggest that there are new rules for coronavirus when it's just doing it what it always does. And that's a big goal of this class is to show you that the rules are the same whether we're talking about viral infection, um, bacterial infection, cancer, autoimmunity, allergies. It's always the same rules. And the immune system doesn't really change. And so <clears throat> it's the same thing with the 
what they're now calling short-lived antibody responses to COVID-19. They're not, they're just going down below the level of detection. Doesn't mean they're not there, because we see this with many uh, other vaccine settings. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I just had a, a general question. Um, about two slides ago when you said the immune cells go up after a, a viral infection. So just when you look at older adults, right, at some point in time, um, their immune system starts to decay. But can you just make the assumption that, you know, um, someone who's older in their 40s or 50s versus me in my 20s has more immune cells? No. No, no. So, um, so what? They have more... It's, how do I say this? They have more memory cells. Or that, you yeah, have, yeah. You have more naive cells. But it's, in terms of percentage, when you make a response, it's 99% of what responded dies. But you're still, so you're, you're changing the composition of your immune system by about 0.1%. It's, it's not a huge difference. Um, there have been studies of how that sort of, you know, increased memory population changes your ability to respond to new things. And I think that's still up in the air. But what we do know is that um, your thymus, which is the source of your T cells, decreases output over time. It's the most active during your, your uh, childhood years. And once you hit puberty, it starts to sort of decay. Um, but it doesn't go away. You still have output well into your 60s. But what we're seeing is that right about mid-70s, you hit a wall and the immune system starts to go down quite a bit. And so what they're losing though, what older people are losing are what we would call naive cells, new T cells that would respond to something you've never seen before. Um, so that that's what's thought of as happening in elderly populations. Thanks. Um, Professor Backman, I have a question as well. Sure. Okay, so my question would be, you said that viral and also bacterial and also sometimes the cancer, the immune response is usually the same. So of course, an innate immune response, the myeloid lineage would have more of a population circulating through the blood. And as we receive adaptive immunity, when the infection occurs, that would increase, correct? Yes. Okay, so for the lymphoids or the lymphocytes that are created, um, they're also used for bacterial infections. Because I always, I always guess that bacterial infections would be more neutralized by macrophages and neutrophils because of phagocytosis. So when that infection would occur, I would imagine those two uh, white blood cells would increase dramatically. But does that also mean the T cells would also increase because well, there's a memory to it? There is, um, but as we'll see during the semester, you absolutely need antibodies for bacterial control. And antibodies come from B cells. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have those, you become what we call a severe combined immunodeficiency patient. You don't have antibodies. Okay. Now, you're correct in that macrophages and granulocytes are very important for, for eliminating bacteria and things that are larger than viruses. But there are still many bacteria that go intracellularly, and so you have to have T cells to kill infected cells. You also need the T cells, particularly CD4 helper cells, to license the B cells to make antibodies. And so it's still, it's still the same rules. You get a T cell response, you get a B cell response, and those aid in clearance of the infection. And when we're talking about an intracellular bacteria, we're, not, we're, we're talking about cells that are bacteria that live inside and replicate inside of white blood cells, not the ones that are engulfed and then, per, and then their antigens are presented on the outside. Or are those also considered intracellular? Yeah, those are, um, they're, they're the same thing. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you so much. Is there a reason why sometimes we get vaccines that have like three things that it's going to uh, give us immunity to, such as uh, MMR, but some of them uh, are only kind of given one at a time? Well, 
Mm, sort of. Um, part of it is convenience, right? It would be great if we, if we came in and we just had to get one shot. Through the age of 18, I think there's, if you got all of the vaccines available, you would something like 76 different shots in the rec recommended vaccine schedule. So we, we have, you know, it's just convenience that we lump put some together. So DTaP, uh, the MMR, those are the two that you get three at a time, right? But there's a concern that if you have too many different things in one vaccine, that the immune system is not going to make a good response to all of them. And so a lot of the times I try to limit how many different things the immune system is responding to at once so that you can make a good response to that one thing. Um, in reality, a lot of it ends up being, well, you know, uh, this company has this vaccine. They're not going to mix it with another company's vaccine because then they lose their profits, right? So there's some, if you want to be cynical about it, there's, there's some um, intellectual property that's also there. But there, you know, for example, the, the flu vaccine, depending on which version you get, you're getting four different flu vaccines, or you're getting vaccines to two, four different flu viruses. Um, so there's a lot of different ones. The, uh, uh, the, one of the bacterial vaccines is actually, you know, it's got 12 different components or 12 different antigens in it. But the idea is that, yeah, we want it to be convenient, but we also might want to make a good response. So we try not to lump everything together. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question um, about when you were talking about a cold infection. Yes. Um, you said something about like it doesn't show any symptoms and that's like because the immune system is compromised. So I was just wondering if this kind of applies to the same thing right now with like all the asymptomatic people that are going around or like it because people just seem to like have normal immune systems but not show any symptoms. No, it's it's not the same thing. And okay. I would, I would caution you that when people say, when they, this term asymptomatic gets thrown about, um, it's, it's more got to do with, okay, you got up one morning, you didn't feel great, but you didn't really feel that sick. So you still went to work and you didn't think anything of it. That's what's happening in most people. They're, they're controlling the infection very quickly and they don't really think that they got sick. And they're certainly not enough to show up at a hospital. So asymptomatic infections, particularly for coronavirus are often well, they didn't come to a hospital, so they must not have been sick. But that's not really the case, right? They, they got sick, but they just didn't get really sick. They were sick enough to go see a doctor. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Just to clarify the question right before. Um, so... If, so if you walk into a clinic and they say, oh, you know, you're, you, you, you need three vaccines here to be up to date. Um, if you were looking to get the best immunity, would you recommend getting those three vaccines scattered out over a long period of time? In, in my opinion, it doesn't actually matter. But the, what I was presenting is what, what some physicians are concerned about is having your immune system try and do too many at the same time. No, I don't think it matters at all. And a lot of that has to do with how the immune system is operating. And in fact, having more might actually think, make things better. One of the very first anti-cancer vaccines, if you want to call it that, was Coley's toxin, where it basically injected killed bacteria into a tumor and helped the immune system realize, oh, I need to make a response to the tumor. So there's, uh, to me, no, I, I don't think that that would be bad to go and get a bunch of vaccines at the same time. And that's what we do. Another way of saying that is, well, if you have a bunch of vaccines at the same time, then they're all providing these, these damp signals that yes, there's something to be making a response to. So the more, more the innate system gets those signals, the better it is off it is in telling the adaptive system, yes, you should make a response. Okay, any more questions?
All right, we'll see you on Thursday.